On behalf of everyone at Gettysburg National Military Park, and on behalf of our friends at the Gettysburg Foundation, I want to welcome you all to Gettysburg National Military Park on the last day of the 151st anniversary of the battle. Uh, we're very gratified to have you here. My name is Christopher Gwynn. I am a park ranger here at Gettysburg. And this is Dan Welch. I'm the Education Programs Coordinator for the Gettysburg Foundation. Let me introduce this program by telling you a very quick story. I am, I'm not from Pennsylvania. I grew up in Massachusetts. I grew up just north of Boston. Hey, ooh. When I was 18, uh, my thought was I'm going to get as far away from home as I can. As far away as I could get was Gettysburg, Pennsylvania at Gettysburg <laughs> College. I had a great time. I became a National Park Service park ranger. And again, uh, I thought, wow, I'm going to join the Park Service. And I'm going to go to all these cool places. I'm going to see all these cool things. The first permanent job I got, guess where it was? It was in Gettysburg. Boston. 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 <laughs> we traveled back to Boston. Anyways, I have a lot of friends in Boston. I made a lot of work connections in Boston. I have a lot of people I care a lot about in Boston. And I had a lot of people who were at the finish line of the Boston Marathon two years ago. And that's no joke. They were there. And um, you all know what happened then. You know what happened at that event. Uh, I had a, a one really good friend who was at the finish line when that bomb went off. And um, if, you, if you've seen any of the footage that came out of that event, if you've seen any of the photographs, when I was, um, when I was, was, was watching those images on TV, what I ended up thinking about was what this battlefield must have looked like. Because on that sidewalk in Boston, a place that I knew really, really well, with a lot of people that I really, really cared about, I mean, it looked like a scene that I, I read out of an account from Pickett's Charge. Blood everywhere, confusion, chaos. And that good friend that I had that was at the finish line, she got hit in the leg by a piece of um, metal, a piece of shrapnel. And um, this is what happened to my friend after that happened. There was confusion, there was chaos. Law enforcement kind of cordoned off the area. And within moments, there were first responders who arrived who knew how to take care of my friend, who knew how to stop the bleeding, who knew how to keep her alive. And then she was taken to an ambulance. And on that ambulance, in that ambulance, there was everything that she needed to stabilize her. Again, to keep her alive. The people on the ambulance, they were trained professionals. They were medics, they were EMTs. Now they were there originally to treat dehydration and sprained ankles and all the things you get when you run, but they knew how to take care of that person. They knew what to do. And the guy driving the ambulance, and as confusing as Boston can be to drive around in it, he knew exactly where to go. He knew exactly what hospital to take her to. And she arrived at the hospital. And they pulled up her medical records. A team of doctors, surgeons, nurses, they worked on her, they triaged her. She was seen by a specialist. And the best person to operate on her, the best person for her case, was the one that did it. And she's still alive today because of a system that was in place in Boston in 2014. That system was in place, a system very similar to it, 151 years ago on this battlefield. And it went through its crucible. It went through its test on this battlefield 151 years ago. And that is the story we're gonna tell over the next however long the weather lasts. That is the story we're gonna focus in on. What happens once this battle's over? What happens to the 28,000 wounded men who have to go from that battlefield to the hospital? It's over there. How are they going to get there? What are the challenges, the, the surgeons, the doctors, the, the volunteers, the nurses, what challenges are they going to have keeping these individuals alive? What does this battlefield look like once the battle's over? Because normally when we talk about Pickett's Charge, we talk about 13,000 Confederates moving across the battlefield, we talk about uh, a brief breakthrough at the angle. We talk about the Second Corps and Winfield Scott Hancock. And then we usually finish off the Battle of Gettysburg by saying that the Confederates were defeated. The next day in a driving rain, they retreated or began to retreat back to Virginia. We talk about Robert E. Lee stoically riding amongst his defeated men, taking complete responsibility for the attack. We talk about the friendship between Winfield Scott Hancock and Lewis Armistead. We talk about all these different things. But once this battle is over, once the, the, the gunfire stops, a whole new battle begins. A whole new fight begins. 
This is not a battle against the Union or Confederate Army. Now it's a battle against death. The weapons used in this new fight, this new battle, they're not scalpels, they're not bandages, uh, they're not, um, excuse me, rifles, they're scalpels. They're not, um, they're not artillery, they're stretchers. This is a battle for survival. It is a battle to stay alive. And again, that is what we are gonna focus on here today. And that's something we don't do a whole lot. Usually when we talk about the, uh, the ending of Pickett's Charge, like I said, we think about Lee riding out among his defeated men. We think about the friendship of Louis Armistead and Winfield Scott Hancock. Uh, one Union and one Confederate both struck down on this battlefield. Honestly, sometimes I think that's a distraction because we remember the end of the battle like the same way the movie Gettysburg ended. That's how it ended. But in reality, I mean, Winfield Scott Hancock, at the end of the day on July 3rd, 1863, has a wound in his upper thigh that one man resembled uh, to, uh, or one man said resembled a, a butcher's knife. Louis Armistead was shot. He's going to suffer in agony for a couple days. Then he's going to die in a strange place, surrounded by strange people, to be buried in a strange land. There's nothing sentimental about that. There's nothing, you know, nostalgic about that. It was brutal. It was hard for the 28,000 wounded men left behind uh, as a result of this battle. That was what they encountered. And if we were on this ridge on the afternoon of July 3rd, the people that were here, they didn't need to be reminded of that. They knew it. All they had to do was look around and survey the carnage and chaos on this ridge. There was uh, one man. His name is Captain Benjamin F. Thompson of the 111th New York. And he looked out on this battlefield. And this is what he remembered years later. He said, the track of the great charge was marked by bodies of men in all possible positions, wounded, bleeding, dying, and dead. Near the line where the final struggle occurred, the men lay in heaps, the wounded wriggling and groaning under the weight of the dead, among whom they were entangled. In my weak and exhausted condition, I could not long endure the gory, ghastly spectacle. I found my head reeling, the tears flowing, and my stomach sick at the sight. For months, the specter haunted my dreams, and even after 47 years, it comes back as the most horrible vision I have ever conceived. That was written by the guy that won the battle, the victor. The Confederates, the vanquished, they looked upon an even bleaker field. Lieutenant Colonel, excuse me, Lieutenant William Tuttle of the 22nd North Carolina, in, in trying to process what he saw on this ridge, wrote home this. He said, I hope to God that none of my friends will ever look on such a sight as that field was I will stop about it. I hope I will get home and disremember it all. What we're going to try to do today is remember some of it anyways. To do that, we're going to follow the path of the wounded from the front lines on Cemetery Ridge back to the initial aid stations behind Cemetery Ridge and talk about how these men were brought there and what they went through. We're going to follow their path even further, hopefully, theoretically, <laughs> to division hospitals behind the lines. Where, um, where these men were taken, where they were triaged. We're going to follow it all the way, weather permitting, <laughs> to the George Spangler Farm, a core hospital. We are going to follow the route of the wounded from the front lines to the operating table. And I think one thing more than anything that I hope you leave this program with today is that this story, this journey, directly affects us today in 2014. And every single one of these individuals was a real human being. We talk about the casualties of Pickett's Charge. Uh, you know, 55%, 6,555. Those are numbers. These people, they weren't numbers, they were men. They were individuals. And Dan here's gonna talk about a few of them right now. Yeah, as Chris mentioned, you know, much of the, the story of Pickett's Charge as it ends, we, we skip over with the retreat to uh, Virginia by the Confederate Army, and we end the story of the Battle of Gettysburg. But as he uh, so uh, poignantly noted, that battle will continue for these wounded men. But who are these wounded men in which we talk about? They are more than that number of wounded. We often talk in abstract, 51,000 casualties of Gettysburg. Who were they? Whose husband, father, cousin were they? Who were these men? One of the soldiers you heard alluded to was a brigadier general, a native of North Carolina who had identified with Virginia long ago, 
Brigadier General Louis Armistead had led about 100 to 150 Confederate soldiers into the Union lines directly behind you and to your rear. And moments after piercing the Union position, he would fall wounded with multiple uh, gunshot wounds. Just a little further, northward on Cemetery Ridge behind you was a New Yorker, a man by the name of Elikium Sherrill, a lieutenant colonel who was a tanner and a farmer, a husband of four, a former state senator, a United States congressman that answered the call for 75,000 troops. On the evening of July 2nd, Sherrill would be fighting at the head of his New York regiment in the fields to your right and front. His commanding officer would be mortally wounded, killed instantly, and he would rise to command the rest of his brigade. But his superiors thought his actions, his command, his leadership was not up to par that evening. And Sherrill would be placed under arrest. In the morning of July 3rd, shortly before this most famous incident of the Battle of Gettysburg, Pickett's Charge began, Sherrill would be restored to command. And as he was on his horse behind the lines of his brigade, not far behind you, the Confederate musket ball came in and found its target. One soldier wrote, while in the command of his brigade and standing in the rear of the 39th New York Volunteers, Sherrill fell mortally wounded by a musket shot to the bowels. Without the knowledge of the men of his own regiment, the dying Sherrill was borne to the rear by some of the members of the 39th New York Volunteers. Another northern soldier even further to the north along the Cemetery Ridge line was a young captain, 21 years of age. He had joined the army in 1861 to escape another battle that he was fighting for many years. A battle that had started at the age of 16. A battle with alcoholism. He decided that by joining the army, having something to focus on, that he may win that battle. And it had been working. With the notoriety of his mother, Harriet Beecher Stowe, an abolitionist from Massachusetts, whose famous 1852 work Uncle Tom's Cabin had not only pushed uh, her family into notoriety, but the cause of ending slavery and the fight uh, for the Union Army, excuse me, for the Union government to put down this rebellion, that notoriety and fame came in handy. She made sure that her son was not only continuing to be a success in that battle against alcoholism, but that his positions left him in the rear of the army, away from harm's danger. But by 1863, he was not content with that. And he would use the notoriety of his mother to secure a position on the staff, staff of Adolf von Steinweir. Steinweir and Harriet Beecher Stowe had been friends before the war. And now, at the height of Pickett's Charge, Stowe, on horseback, on Cemetery Hill behind you, would receive a ghastly wound, a shell fragment from art Confederate artillery fire would come in and tear off part of his right ear, his jaw, some of his teeth and tongue. Stowe, Sherrill, and Armistead are just three of the wounded men experiencing that chaos, that confusion, looking for some sort of help, some sort of treatment, some way to leave this field of battle and be taken rearward to a station where they can receive that help. But they are not the only stories that we are going to hear this evening of the men that will be wounded in this area and require that evacuation further to the east, to your left and rear, across these fields and towards surgeons and medical staff that will be able to treat their wounds. We're going to make our way a little further southward along the Union position here on Cemetery Ridge and become aware of some of the many other stories, the many other men who were in need of medical attention and evacuation from Cemetery Ridge. Kill it. These are the statistics, at least some of them. 1,123 Confederates killed in the assault on July 3rd. 180, uh, 1,893 wounded in the uh, division of Johnston Pettigrew alone. 833 wounded Virginians of Pickett's command were taken in by the Union Army. 650 wounded men in Tremble's command were taken in by the Union Army. All that doesn't include the Union casualties. 
They suffered as many as 1,500 men killed, wounded, missing on July 3rd on this ridge. And the fighting, the combat, didn't matter if you were a major general, didn't matter if you were a lieutenant, didn't matter if you were a corporal, the bullets didn't care. It didn't matter who you were, where you came from. You could be cut down. You could be cut down. One of the men hit on this ridge on July 3rd was a young lieutenant. His name was George Woodruff, and he commanded a battery in Ziegler's Grove. Uh, Woodruff, he was a normal guy. He was from Marshall, Michigan. His uh, father was a judge. He could have done anything, but he goes to West Point. Uh, he, he earns the, the nickname, the sobriquet, Little Dad. I'm not sure why, maybe because he was kind of like a father figure. He, um, he graduated 19th in his class at West Point. He graduates in June of 1861. He's a young guy. He's a young individual. And on July 3rd, he's in that grove. He's commanding that artillery when he's struck by a Confederate bullet. It was the kind of wound that, that other men would look at you and they could tell, yeah, you're going to die. We can't do much for you, but you're not going to die right away. Uh, the second in command of his battery, a gentleman by the name of Tully McRae, and another individual they took, they took this young guy, this young George Woodruff, this lieutenant, and they dragged him behind a tree in Ziegler's Grove, and they left him there because there was nothing they could do for him. There was nothing they could do. Woodruff had in his pocket that day a letter, and it was a letter from his father back in Michigan telling him that his mother had just died. The letter as of yet was unopened. There's another gentleman. This guy's a Confederate. He's in the 9th Virginia. His name is James Crocker. And James Crocker, he's um, from a rather well-to-do family. He is no stranger to battlefields. He is no stranger to the horrors of war. He was hit at the Battle of Malvern Hill in the summer of 1862. The bullet went through his neck, through his shoulder, and through his arm. And somehow he lived. He said he thought he was going to die on that battlefield, but he didn't. He lived to be wounded again out on that battlefield in front of that rock wall. And he's wounded, and he's captured by the Union Army. And he's going to be shipped back to one of the field hospitals behind the lines. Those were on. Um, Crocker was a captain. Woodruff was a lieutenant. There were many privates killed and wounded, many sergeants wounded. There were many generals wounded. One of them was a guy that you probably have heard of before. His name is Brigadier General John Gibbon. John Gibbon commanded a division in the 2nd Army Corps. He is an incredibly effective commander on the battlefield. He was one of the original commanders of the Iron Brigade. And at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, when the two-hour cannonade that precedes Pickett's Charge begins, he's down at the Peter Frey Farm, which we can't quite see because of the ridge behind us. He's sitting with a uh, lieutenant of his, a staff officer named Frank Haskell. Frank Haskell had this to say about John Gibbon, who at the time was 36 years old. Gibbon is compactly made, neither spare nor corpulent, with a ruddy complexion of chestnut brown hair, a clean shaved face except his mustache, uh, deep blue calm eyes, sharp slightly aquiline nose, compressed mouth, with an air of calm firmness in his manner. An air of calm firmness, that describes John Gibbon. During the bombardment, he walks among his men. During the Confederate assault, he gets on top of his horse. He's riding around at the height of the battle directing his men. He's most likely somewhere behind the 19th Maine, just down the ridge, when a Confederate bullet hits him. It enters the middle part of his left arm, goes through his arm into his shoulder, it uh, fractures his collarbone, and then it exit, uh, exits out his back. So you can only imagine how painful a wound that must have been. Uh, John Gibbon, though, he, um, he was very confused about the nature of his wound. Because of the shock to the human body of that initial blow with the bullet, he didn't feel where it came in. He only felt where it exited him. And I think his number one concern, besides am I going to die or am I going to live, is I've been shot in the back. And that's what my friends are going to know about what I did at Gettysburg. I got shot in the back. John Gibbon would say that he uh, would leave the front lines behind as the roar of battle was still in his ears. Because now John Gibbon, he needs to go find help. He needs to find an ambulance. He needs someone that knows what to do. And he's not the only high-ranking officer on this ridge that's hit. Perhaps the most famous is a major general, he's a big deal, Winfield Scott Hancock. At the height of the battle, 
Winfield Scott Hancock is riding along the battle lines. He's somewhere in this vicinity, behind a brigade of men from Vermont. And what Hancock is trying to do is get these men to swing out in the battlefield and fire into the flanks of the Confederates. Uh, men said that just to look at Hancock, just to see this guy on the battlefield, filled you with inspiration. And some men, they just have that ability. Uh, some men just inspire that kind of confidence in other people. And Hancock was one of them. There was a, a young lieutenant named George Benedict from Vermont. He was watching Hancock on the battlefield. And uh, he said this as he watched Hancock, or he thought of it later anyways. He said, Hancock is the most striking man I ever saw on horseback and magnificent in the flush and excitement of battle. But then Benedict noted that uh, Hancock reeled in the saddle and shouted out an exclamation. We can only guess what that exclamation might have been. Because Hancock's been hit. And the first thing Benedict does with another officer is they rush over to Hancock, they help him down, and at first Winfield Scott Hancock is so stunned he can't even speak. He just motions down to a wound that was in his upper uh, thigh, right near his groin, a painful wound. And this is, um, this is what Benedict did. He said, we laid him upon the ground and opened his clothing where he indicated by a movement of his hand that he was hurt. A ragged hole, an inch or more in diameter from which the blood was pouring profusely was disclosed in the upper part and on the side of his thigh. He was naturally in some alarm for his life. But Benedict knows a guy in the 13th Vermont, a private named Clark, who has a small tourniquet. So immediately, Benedict rushes over, he goes to this guy, he grabs the tourniquet, he rushes back to Hancock, who must have been relieved that at least someone was doing something for him. And the idea was they're gonna use this tourniquet to stop Hancock's bleeding, keep him from bleeding to death. But the tourniquet's too small, and the wound is up too high on his leg, they can't do anything for him. And then Winfield Scott Hancock begins to panic. And he shouts out uh, to the men around him, quote, get something around it quick. Don't let me bleed to death. The uh, brigade commander of these men from Vermont, a gentleman by the name of George Stannard, sometimes it's pronounced Stannard. And Stannard has on him a big oversized handkerchief. And Stannard and Benedict, they rush over, and they're going to use that handkerchief to try to stop the bleeding, to try to save Hancock's life. This is what they uh, said. Benedict recalled, as I helped to pass it around General Hancock's leg, I saw that the blood, being dark in color and not coming in jets, could not be from an artery. And I said to him, this is not arterial blood, General. You will not bleed to death. When Hancock heard that, to Hancock, that sounds like, oh, that's a guy who knows the human body. That's a guy who's maybe seen battlefield wounds before. He mistakes Benedict for a doctor. And at first, Hancock's quite relieved. He says, that's good, thank you for that doctor. And then Benedict relates how he took the barrel of a pistol and he wrapped it around the handkerchief, the bandana, and he twisted it into a tourniquet and initially stopped the bleeding. And you would think at that point in time, the bleeding's under control, the first thought that Winfield Scott Hancock would have is, dear God, get me off this battlefield. Get me back where John Gibbons going. Get me an ambulance. Get me a doctor. Get me a surgeon. On the contrary, Hancock refuses to be moved. There's a, a, a colonel that rushes over with his staff. They offer to take him back. Hancock says no. And they lay Hancock down so that his head is pointing north, his feet are pointing towards the battle, and that's where he's going to stay, in part to watch the battle. The other part of that is, he has no staff officers with him. Every staff officer Hancock has, they're off on some errand. They're off uh, directing the battle, going to me, going to Caldwell, going to Gibbon, going to Hayes. It's not until a few moments later that two staff officers arrive. One is a guy by the name of William Mitchell. The other is a man by the name of Henry Bingham. And naturally, they see Hancock on the ground. They see their chief. They want to get him back. They want to get him to an aid station, a field hospital. Before Hancock allows them to go after an ambulance, he sends Bingham to a guy by the name of John C. Caldwell, who's now in command of the Second Corps. So he makes sure that vacuum in command is full, is filled. He sends William Mitchell with a verbal note, verbal message to George Meade, basically relating the situation as Hancock sees it. And it's not until after those two gentlemen have performed their task that Hancock tells Mitchell to go get him an ambulance.
This sets in motion this medical system for the care of the wounded that we're really going to be focusing in on from now until whenever the, uh, the program's over. But um, the system that Hancock and Gibbon and Stowe and Cheryl are going to experience is a system of medical care, at least as far as the Army of the Potomac was concerned, that was markedly different than what James Crocker might have encountered at Malvern Hill in 1862, or that what John Gibbon might have gone through at the Battle of Fredericksburg in December of that year. And to talk a little bit about that, how would wounded men have been treated in 1861 and 1862? I'm gonna turn it over to Dan. You know, as Chris related to you the incidents of Boston last year, I wanna take you back almost a decade now to Hurricane Katrina in 2005. I want you to think back about the, the many news uh, clips and footage of you saw of people looking for care, looking for aid, uh, not really knowing where to go, how to get help uh, in this mass sea of confusion and damage. Hurricane Katrina and its effects on the citizens of Louisiana and many of those other southern states is a corollary to what you could have experienced in the Army in 1861 and 1862 with your medical care. You are thrown into an environment of chaos, confusion, violence, and once you're wounded, if you are wounded and you are seeking help, help is going to be hard to find because it is also, in, this medical system during this time is also in a state of chaos and confusion, much like the battlefield. You see, when the American Civil War broke out in 1861, the medical staffing of the United States Army was at a peacetime level. There were about 10,000 soldiers in the United States Army in 1860. They are spread out vastly across the country, many posts out west. For 10,000 United States soldiers in 1860, there were about 100 medical personnel to treat these men all across the country. When war breaks out in 1861, the United States Army is going to have even less personnel because some of them will leave their post, will leave their uh, allegiance and commission in the United States Army and join the Confederate forces. And when the first land battle of the American Civil War breaks out in July of 1861 on the plains of Manassas, you as a wounded soldier are going to be in, in a world of chaos and confusion that even battle cannot relate to. A medical department, a trained medical staff are things that will not be even heard of for two years into the future of the American Civil War. Let me give you one example from the Battle of First Manassas. One particular uh, regiment, a Union regiment of about 700 men marched into combat on July 21st, 1861 to help with their medical needs during and after the battle, they had four ambulances that were able to take one man off the field at a time. They had one surgeon and three medical staff to assist that surgeon. It would be wholly inadequate for this battle and future battles to come. The principal lesson from Bull Run in 1861 is the value of preparedness. Uh, the wounded lying on the ground, which laid there for days, would feel the rain, heat, lack of attention, no water, no food. Unfortunately, from 1861, however, to 1862, there would be little improvements. Let me relate to you another soldier of a, a, a wounded Union soldier at First Manassas went through the, unex the unfortunate experience of a musket ball, Confederate musket ball, going through both legs, breaking both legs. When the Union Army uh, lost that battle on the afternoon of July 21st and began their retreat not more than two dozen miles to Washington, D.C., they left behind most of the wounded, including the soldier. For him, it would be an agonizing seven days using two rifles as crutches walking on broken legs back to the defenses of Washington, D.C., before he was even seen by a surgeon. He would ultimately uh, lose both of those legs to amputation, but survive those wounds. You were on your own hitch to receive medical care if you were wounded in combat. 
Now, many historians will argue the uh, theory of red tape in the government in 1861 and 1862 that did not allow developments in the medical system. Uh, many developments that were being talked around by medical personnel in both armies. Uh, both armies. Um, but unfortunately, regardless if you label it political red tape, the system does not get any better. A year later, both of these armies would return to Manassas, the end of August of 1862, where even more casualties, more violence, and more confusion would reign for several days. The situation had not improved. Unfortunately for the medical system at that time, if you were a wounded soldier, you would await, hopefully, some members of your regiment's band. Common uh, story of the American Civil War is that as a regimental bandsman, you played the drum, you played uh, the, the piccolo, you played uh, maybe some of the brass instruments, that when the fighting broke out, you put those instruments down, you picked up a stretcher and helped to remove the wounded. Unfortunately, at first Manassas and all the battles in between the second Manassas, you could not count on one of those bandsmen to come and pick you up. While researching this program to share with you this evening, a number of court martials against bandsmen who would put down their instruments, go out on that field of battle, and begin to see the true cost and horrors of war would simply leave. They would never return, and they would not take with them wounded soldiers. So you are on your own hook from 1861 to 1862 to get off the field. Not only are these bandsmen um, abandoning their posts and not utilizing stretchers to get you off the field, we have a shortage of ambulances. There's not enough to get you off the field once the stretcher gets you to an ambulance. The people that were hired, subcontracted, to drive these ambulances off the battlefield with wounded men have also succumb to the true cost and horrors of war. They too would come onto the battlefield, see all of these wounded and dead soldiers, and simply leave. It gets so bad at the Second Battle of Bull Run, or Manassas, in August of 1862, that the Secretary of War is going through the streets of Washington, D.C., and rounding up hacks, carriage drivers, anybody with wagons, and he is ordering them to make their way westward towards Manassas, go out on the field, and begin to collect the wounded. All of this will take time. And time is a factor that many of these wounded men do not have. But these are just some of the many complications from a poor medical system in 1861 and 1862. Let me share with you some of the other issues that you would run into if you were a wounded soldier. In 1861 and 1862, there were no mobile field hospitals. We had these permanent, large hospitals set up in metropolitan areas. Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Philadelphia. We had nothing permanent for you, or semi-permanent, mobile, to come to the field of battle for you to recover sufficiently before being transported further to the rear. There was no organization to the communications between doctors and surgeons on the battlefield, or doctors, surgeons, medical personnel in those metropolitan hospitals. There was nobody in charge of handling supplies for the individual hospitals. Uh, a lot of waste, a system that was completely inefficient. Regimental units cared for the wounded at the front, general hospitals received them at the base, and between them, everything was haphazard. Hopefully you could find some supplies. Uh, medical uh, staff for artillery. If you were an artillery unit, such as uh, our, our, our friend Woodruff, that we're going to get to know very well tonight. In 1861 and 1862, there is no medical staff for artillery batteries. We have surgeons that are wholly incompetent. Some that had served in the War of 1812, that had served in the Mexican War, uh, that have been completely removed from the field of medicine for 20, 30, 40 years are now trying to use medical techniques that were used earlier. There's no effective system of reports to file after the hospital opens. How many have been wounded? How much supplies have you used? How much more supplies will you need? But as a level of comfort, think about this. Out of all these issues, if you were wounded in 1861 and 1862 and you were taken to a field hospital, there you would lie 
day after day, week after week, in the same uniform. There were no clothes for you to change into. You would lie there in your blood-stained uniform, sweat-stained, sweat-soaked uniform. You would lay on the same stretcher that you were placed on when they finally removed you from the field. Can you imagine being put in that position or having an operation or a surgery to save your life and being placed back in those bloody, sweat-stained, powder-begrimed clothes? 1861 and 1862 for the medical department and the Union Army is something you fear. You hope not to be wounded in combat because you may lose your life. You hope not to be wounded in combat so you don't get taken to a field hospital. The men in the ranks know what they're facing. They understand the confusion, the chaos, the disorganization of the medical corps that is in the rear of the army. But all of that is going to change. Because just before the Battle of Second Manassas in August 1862, the Union Army, the Army of the Potomac in the Eastern Theater, is going to receive a new medical director. And his name is Jonathan Letterman. Letterman is going to begin to revolutionize the medical department and how these men will be treated, how they will get off the battlefield, if they'll get clean clothes to make sure there's enough medicine and food for the hospital. Letterman is going to revolutionize that system between August of 1862 and September of 1862, when perhaps one of the more famous battles of the American Civil War will take place, the Battle of Antietam. And there, Letterman and his new ideas that Chris is going to talk about in just a few moments in this program are going to begin to revolutionize medical care on an American Civil War battlefield and battlefield landscape. By Fredericksburg in December of 1862, in Chancellorsville in May of 1863, this system has been put in place and is beginning to prove extremely effective. That system will ultimately become known as the Letterman system, after its, its uh, inventor, Jonathan Letterman. It will save countless lives on numerous fields of battle, including Gettysburg, and some of the men's lives who we're going to learn more about this evening. The Letterman system and those medical personnel operating under it will be our next stop as we continue to follow in the footsteps of men such as Armistead, Hancock, Gibbon, Sherrill, and Stowe. As we make our way to the next stop, I want you to think about for just a moment that you are following in the footsteps of these wounded soldiers 151 years later. You are the first to do so in 151 years. And with every step is a passing moment in 2014, and in 1863, where this men's battle for life after their wounding is very real and constant. All right, again, folks, this is the point of no return. <laughs> the next stop is going to be a spot that I can guarantee most of you have probably never been before. Uh, so stick with us. We're going to cross a towny town road, and we'll see you on the other side. All right, everybody point to the Pennsylvania Memorial or the direction in which it is in. Yes, yeah, over that way. North is that way. I don't want to discombobulate you. Where in the world are we? No we're in Gettysburg. <laughs> we're in Gettysburg. More specifically, or more particularly, we are in the, um, the backyard of the, the William Peterson family, or Patterson family, excuse me, Patterson family. You can actually, you can kind of see the Patterson house through the trees there. Uh, William Patterson is 40 years old. He is a typical Adams County farmer. His wife, Lydia, is 41. They have, guess how many kids? 16. 12. They have eight. They have eight. Eight. Oldest is 17. The youngest is one. Their names, for your information, are William, Elizabeth, Jacob, Henry, Sarah, Lavinia, Louisa, John. That adds nothing to the program. I just like Lavinia. I like that name. Um, again, Patterson is a typical Adams County subsistence farmer. This is his property. He purchases it in 1849. The house uh, it probably dates from that. It might be a little bit earlier than that. Probably about 1849. This house is, is a monument to the Letterman system. It is a monument to the, the system that is going to take the wounded from that ridge where we just were to the, to the major core and division field hospitals we are going to go to. 
Um, now, Dan alluded to the Letterman system earlier. It comes about as a failure, as a result of the failure of the medical system in 1861 and 1862. Uh, Jonathan Letterman, when he takes over, is 33 years old. This is a professional soldier, but he's also a professional doctor. He's seen combat. He knows, he knows what combat and what bloodshed is like. And Jonathan Letterman, basically, he believes that bandages can win battles. Normally, the thought at that point in time was medicine is something that we do only because we have to do it. It's not a priority. Letterman believes the exact opposite. And he will initiate a system of sweeping reforms which is going to revolutionize combat medicine, which is going to revolutionize battlefield medicine, which is still being used today to a certain degree in places like Afghanistan. And it has its origin in these battles during the American Civil War. So very quickly, this is what Jonathan Letterman does. First of all, he helps clean up the camps. He makes sure, for example, in the, uh, in the uh, early part of uh, 1863 that the men in the Army of the Potomac are getting fruits and vegetables to combat scurvy. But he really focuses in on battlefield medicine. How do you treat men who have been wounded in combat? Um, Dan mentioned the fact that previous to Letterman, if you were wounded, your, uh, your first responder, if you will, might be a musician in your regimental band. Um, that'd be like if you got hit by a car crossing the road, the first person that shows up is the clarinet player from the Gettysburg Marching Band. That's not exactly an optimal situation. Um, Dan talked about how if you were wounded, you might have to depend on basically a private contractor to load you in an ambulance and get you off the battlefield. That'd be like when we were crossing the road, if you got hit by a car, we have to call a taxi company to come and get you and take you to the hospital. That taxi's not going to have anything in it to keep you alive. That taxi probably, unless he has GPS, doesn't know where the hospital is. Letterman changes that. He creates a professional ambulance corps. It's organized not at the regimental level, but at the division, at the corps level. These are guys who are trained to come get you and put you in the ambulance. They're going to do it in a way that's not going to further injure you. They are soldiers, so they're not going to bolt once the bullets start to fly. They're not going to get out of there once the shells start to explode. These guys, they're going to show up, and they're going to know what to do, and they're going to put you on a wagon, and that wagon is going to have bandages, and it's going to have water. And these ambulance drivers are going to know exactly where to take you, what hospital to go to, because Another of Jonathan Letterman's changes is that he's going to create a system of hospitals based not on the regimental level, but again, on the division level, on the, uh, the core level. So rather than having one or two regimental surgeons, you're going to go to a major hospital. You're going to go to a, a hospital where, first of all, there's a hospital administrator. There's a surgeon in charge, and his whole job is to run that division or core hospital. He's going to be responsible. He's not going to perform primary surgery. He's going to run the hospital. We have him today in hospitals all across the United States, a hospital administrator. There's going to be another guy that works with that guy. And his entire job is to keep records, medical records. How many wounded am I treating? How many bandages am I going through? Now, Dan alluded to that before. There's no medical records. But now that Letterman has instituted this change, well, we can learn from what happened at Antietam. We can learn from what happened at Chancellorsville, because now we know how many men we can theoretically treat in a day. We know what kind of wounds we're getting. We know how much medicine we're going through. We know how many bandages we're going through. That is because of Jonathan Letterman. He's going to have his surgeons at these major division and core field hospitals working really in teams of three. So that ambulance, is going to pick you up. It's going to bring you to a division or a core field hospital. You're going to be triaged. So if I can't save you, I'm not going to waste my time with you. If you're wounded but you can wait, you're going to wait. If the only way to save your life is to operate immediately, we're going to take you first. And then these surgeons, they're going to look at you. They're going to evaluate your case. They're going to debate what to do. And then the best surgeon for your case, if you've got a fracture to the leg, if you've got a mini ball in your shoulder, if you've got a head wound, the surgeon, who's the best at treating head wounds, is going to be the guy that takes care of you. But those are the, the division 
and the core hospitals. Right behind the battle line, there are going to be basically temporary field hospitals where you're going to initially go, they're going to treat you. If you've got a, a, a scratch on your arm, if you've got a minor wound to your leg, well, those dressers at those temporary field hospitals, those aid stations, they're going to dress the wound. And guess what? You're going to go back to the battle line. You're going to go back to the fire line. You're going to go back to Cemetery Ridge. This is the system that Letterman has set up. So you're wounded on the battlefield. An ambulance is going to come with a stretcher, and theoretically, they're going to take you to an aid station. The Patterson Farm was an aid station. You would be treated there. If you could go back, you would. But if you need to go back to a core hospital, they're going to send you there. This is the system that Letterman has set up. And it, it works remarkably well. There was, at least in theory, there was a, um, a uh, doctor, his name was Francis Wafer, or Wafer. And uh, he, um, he worked at not the Patterson Farm, but one a little bit further north down the Tawny Town Road. It's where John Nicholas lives. John Nicholas here, the Frey Farm. And this is how he described his setup. He said, this temporary hospital was merely a place where some surgeons who were on duty on the field assembled to apply light dressings to the wounds and superintend the removal of the wounded in ambulances to operating hospitals further in the rear. It was a small stone farmhouse on the Tawny Town Road, a little more than a quarter of a mile in rear of our line. That's what the Frey Farm was. That's what the Patterson Farm was. And then from there, you'd be shipped further south. And again, theoretically, that system works great. Works really, really well. But nothing ever works out exactly as, as one plans it. On July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863, the Battle of Gettysburg, the Second Army Corps is going to establish a series of divisional hospitals in the woods right behind you and two more further down the road. These are big hospitals. The aid stations are that way. You'd be sent to the divisional hospitals. Problems arise right away. And this is from the report of a doctor named Justin Dwinell. First problem was that the wagons containing all the supplies, the bandages, the food, the shovels, the pickaxes, everything you need to establish a major hospital were not allowed to come to the battlefield. They were parked along uh, the Baltimore Pike as far away as Westminster, Maryland. Well, why? Why wouldn't you bring them up? Because the prevailing thought at the time is that bandages, they don't win battles, bullets do. You gotta keep the road clear from men, ammunition, artillery, and so they're just stuck back there. They're stuck back there. And this is what Dwinell writes. It was an unfortunate circumstance that our hospital wagons containing tents, blankets, cooking utensils, provisions, shovels, axes, and medical stores could not follow the army. I do not know whether the hospital wagons were prevented from coming up in time by an express order or by the misconstruction of an order. Nothing, however, but to gain a victory should ever prevent these wagons from following the ammunition train. So they got these hospitals set up, but they don't have the stuff they need. That's the first problem. Second problem is these division hospitals, these major hospitals on July 2nd, they're pretty good where they are. But on July 3rd, they're way too close to the front lines. Because what happens during the bombardment prior to Pickett's Charge? They overshot. They overshot the ridge. So I want you to imagine the wounded are spread out in those woods, in the fields here. There are major hospitals further down the road, same case. And you're that surgeon, Justin Dwinell. It's a little after one o'clock. And now the Confederates begin to shell the Union position on Cemetery Ridge, but you have shells landing in your hospital. That is a problem. What are you gonna do about it? What do you do? You're Justin Dwinell. How do you handle that situation? You're gonna stay there and hope for the best? They gotta get these wounded guys further to the rear. They gotta take these major hospitals and move them back. How are you going to move all these wounded men? An ambulance, theoretically. You bring ambulances up, you'd send them further to the rear. And that's what's happening during the bombardment and during Pickett's Charge back at this aid station and back at that divisional hospital behind you. They're working hard getting these wounded men, some of them who can't walk, some of them who can't move, some of them who can only hobble along, and they're getting them farther back to the rear, as far away as Rock Creek. They're using their ambulances to do it. Granite Schoolhouse Lane, which is just beyond those trees, becomes a highway of the maimed and wounded. But let's say you're William Mitchell, 
staff officer to Winfield Scott Hancock, and your general's wounded, and you got to go get an ambulance. And it's a little after, oh, 345, 4 o'clock. How many ambulances are you going to think are, are free and available for you to use for Winfield Scott Hancock? Zero. William Mitchell, Hancock's st staff officer. He delivers his message to George Meade. He comes back. He's allowed to go find an ambulance, and he cannot find an ambulance for Major General Winfield Scott Hancock. And everybody writes about this guy running around this area of the battlefield trying to find a doctor, trying to find an ambulance for the commander of the 2nd Army Corps. Uh, Francis Wafer, or Waffer, who I just wrote, uh, talked about, he writes about it. He says it was about the commencement of their cannonade that an orderly came to the house in search of a surgeon for General Hancock. I did not hear this, but my orderly told me afterwards that one surgeon refused to go and that man went away threatening to report all those surgeons present. Uh, Gibbon writes about it. They can't find a, an ambulance for Hancock. Eventually, they go all the way back to that division hospital, and William Mitchell finally finds a doctor. He's uh, Alexander Doherty. He's the chief medical officer of the entire Second Army Corps. They get an ambulance, and they go back to Hancock. Um, he's still back where we last had our stop. He's back on Cemetery Ridge. About 20 minutes have elapsed. And if you've ever called 911 and you're waiting for them to show up, 20 minutes feels like a long time. Uh, they arrive. And the first thing Doherty does is he probes Hancock's wound. He takes his uh, forefinger and he shoves it in up to the knuckle. And he's trying to find the, the wound or the, the projectile that's inside Winfield Scott Hancock. First thing he pulls out isn't a bullet. It's some pieces of wood and a bent ten-penny nail. Because when Hancock was hit, he was on the saddle. And the Confederate bullet went through the saddle and into his abdomen. Um, and, it, and Doherty couldn't get the bullet out. But now they have an ambulance. And by this point in time, Hancock is being sent to the rear. Gibbon is being sent to the rear. And they're going to go to some major hospitals that are in the process of being set up way to the rear. Um, these individuals that I mentioned, Doherty, Dwinell, the, the surgeons who are working these hospitals, they very rarely get talked about. But these people were fascinating individuals, and in a very true sense, they're the real heroes of this battle. And Dan's going to briefly relate some of their stories to you. You know, not only are these surgeons, as medical staff, you know, fighting to save as many lives as possible, and for our storyline today on the afternoon of July 3rd, but they are also fighting another battle to overcome this stigma attached to the medical department of the Union Army. Remember the poor state of medical affairs in 1861 and in 1862. These wounded men who we're following in their footsteps today Hancock, Gibbon, Sherrill, Stowe, and many others, they are not new to the Army. They have literally survived through 1861 and 1862 on those battlefields, and in some instances have survived the state of medical affairs. Being previously wounded, experiencing what a hospital was like during the first two years of the American Civil War. So as they are being transported eastward, back here to the division and eventually the core level hospitals, um, they have a, a, a picture in their mind of what to expect. And hopefully these surgeons, with the level of care, the organization of the hospital, the supplies at these locations, uh, how they're going to be treated, having a fresh set of clothes for them to be placed in, will begin to recover the reputation of the medical department of the Union Army's Army of the Potomac. So as Chris mentioned, who are some of these men? We talk about generals, we talk about uh, lower ranking officers, but we very rarely look into the lives of these surgeons that are at every passing moment um, checking in on and operating on other wounded soldiers. One of those soldiers that, uh, excuse me, surgeons that Chris mentioned was Justin Dwinell. Justin Dwinell was born uh, to a prominent family in New York in January of 1822. What's so striking about Dwinell is he writes with such clarity uh, about his profession of medicine. Uh, he's such an instrumental person in the Union Army 2nd Corps aid stations and divisional and corps level hospitals that we're going to hear a little bit more about as we continue eastward this evening. But what's uh, frightening is that we don't know much about his medical education. 
I'm sure many of you that go to your family practitioner, either uh, out in the waiting room or in one of the uh, exam rooms, you see their medical degrees proudly displayed on the wall. So you know that they have been properly trained to treat you. But for Justin Dwinell, we don't know if he was entirely educated in the medical profession. We know that he attended a year of Albany Medical School. We know he attended a year of Jefferson uh, Medical College. And in both instances, he wrote down that he was a practicing physician. Why would a practicing physician need to go to medical school? It's a perplexing question. Um, but eventually, he will settle. Uh, in Syracuse and Tully, New York, and begin to practice medicine uh, before the American Civil War. He'll have a family, he'll marry in 1847, he'll have four children, uh, and his last child will be born just a month before the war breaks out, before the firing on Fort Sumter occurs, and he decides to join up. And he'll go just across the New York border into Pennsylvania and join up with the 71st PA, who ironically on the afternoon of July 3rd is fighting desperately in the angle on Cemetery Ridge. Later, he'll move up uh, the rank scale and be transferred to the 106th Pennsylvania. But he is just one of the surgeons operating these divisional and core level hospitals in the woods behind you. As we continue on with the program tonight, you're going to uh, eventually arrive at the 11th Corps Field Hospital. And there's two other surgeons I'd like to talk to you about that are at that location. One is Daniel Britton. Daniel Britton is the chief surgeon of the 11th Corps Field Hospital, which is located at the George Spangler Farm. Uh, he's a native of Chester County, Pennsylvania, born there in 1837, a graduate of Yale and Jefferson Medical Colleges. Uh, we do know his medical qualifications for treating uh, soldiers. But when the war breaks out in 1861, instead of signing up immediately to offer his assistant, his medical knowledge, he decides to leave the country goes to study abroad. He goes to Europe. <clears throat> Europe is in the cutting edge of medical technology at the time. They're in the cutting edge of a new course of study known as microbiology and using this thing known as a microscope to begin to figure out what is making you sick, what causes infections, and things of that nature. So from 1861 to 1862, while soldiers in the Union and Confederate armies are experiencing horrific medical care, uh, at the beginning of the war, he is studying the best medical practices of the time. And will return in 1862 after a year of study abroad and immediately enlist in the U.S. Army. He tells us of what it's been like on July 1st and on July 2nd at the 11th Corps Field Hospital at the Spangler Farm, not far away. He said the wounded soon began to pour in, giving us such sufficient occupation that from the 1st of July till the afternoon of the 5th, I was not absent from the hospital more than once, and then, but for an hour or two. Very hard work it was, too, and little sleep fell to our share. Four operating tables were going night and day. On the 4th of July, which in its surroundings were gloomy enough, was enlivened by our belief that we had gained a victory. The number in the hospital was a thousand. A heavy rain came over in the afternoon, and as we laid many in spots without shelter, now some indeed in the barnyard where the foul water oozed up into their undressed wounds, the sight was harassing in the extreme. We worked with little intermission and with a minimum amount of sleep. On one day, I arose at 2 a.m. and worked incessantly until midnight. I doubt if I ever worked harder at a more disagreeable occupation. With him at the 11th Corps Field Hospital was a doctor from New York, Henry Van Arnhem. Born in March of 1819 in Marcellus, New York, he began his medical studies in 1841. He would uh, leave for Geneva College in 1842 and finally migrate westward out to the Buckeye State of Ohio where he would graduate from Willoughby College. He would practice medicine for just three years in Burton, New York before finally settling in Franklinville. There, not only would he practice medicine, he would also serve in his state assembly. And that experience would key him in on some of that red tape I talked about earlier, to changing the system from 1861 and 1862 to this new system uh, practiced and adopted by Jonathan Letterman. Finally, in 1862, September of 1862, as the fighting is dying down on the plains around Sharpsburg, Maryland, Dr. Henry Van Arnhem is signing up with the 154th New York as a surgeon 
to treat men of this war. These are just some of the many uh, surgeons and medical staff that are not only fighting to keep these men alive and are preparing for men like Cheryl and Stowe and Hancock and Gibbon who are coming across that field of Cemetery Ridge in front of you and towards this rear area. But they're hoping that this new system that's been put in place, despite its difficulties of having many of the implements still in the rear in Westminster, Maryland, that they can not only save lives, but salvage the reputation of their profession in the Army of the Potomac here at Gettysburg in 1863. We're going to continue now to follow in the footsteps of these men that we are continuing to get to know throughout the course of this program as we make our way to a site very few people uh, visit here, one of the division field hospitals for the Second Army Corps at Granite Schoolhouse. Well, I want to uh, welcome you to uh, the vicinity of the Granite Schoolhouse. As you can uh, imagine, uh, getting to the actual foundations would be quite a challenge in today's uh, current setup with uh, a lot of the underbrush and growth back here. But before this, was, this area was the Granite Schoolhouse, it was owned by the family of George and Elizabeth Spangler. Uh, George and Elizabeth Spangler, whose farm we're going to end at this evening, uh, purchased their original small portion of property in 1848. And over the course of the 15 years leading up to the Battle of Gettysburg, would continue to expand their property uh, to what included the area you're now standing in, a good portion off into the distance in front of you, as well as Powers Hill, uh, an, a hill that will play a key role in the Battle of Gettysburg on July 2nd and July 3rd. And what we're going to hear the story about the 11th Corps Field Hospital and, and the George Spangler family, we're going to hear that they're going to be visited by a lot of medical officers and Union Army officers on July 1st and July 2nd, 1863. Uh, but they're also going to be visited by members of the Adams County government and, and uh, uh, county politicians and things of that nature uh, because in, in 1860, uh, Adams County, and particularly Gettysburg, is looking to expand their school system a little further. Um, they have some schools in town, north of town, west town, east of town, but there's not a particular school just south of town uh, as they're making their way towards the Maryland line. So they're going to approach the Spangler family and ask for a right of way of land to build this school. And in 1860, they begin construction on what will become known as Granite Schoolhouse. By 1861, the school is done, construction is, is over, classes are about ready to start, except there's one problem. They would have, the students and teacher would have to get here on a very similar trail you had this evening. There was no road to get to the school itself. So by late 1860, early 1861, some of these county officials come back to the Spanglers and ask for a right of way of land to build a road to connect the schoolhouse. Granite Schoolhouse Lane's importance cannot be uh, appreciated enough when we are talking about this story tonight. Because not only is it going to serve the medical corps of the Union Army during the Battle of Gettysburg and for the days and weeks afterwards, it's also going to serve large portions of the Union Army's infantry and artillery. We are about two miles south from that circle in the center of Gettysburg, that roundabout. This is the first road south of the town that is going to connect two key roads. The Baltimore Pike to your right, the Tawny Town Road to your left. Roads are going to play a vital part and why the Battle of Gettysburg is going to happen where it does and affects how the battle is going to be fought. And for the evacuation of the wounded and for the movement of large portions of the Union Army's 5th Corps and the Union Army's artillery reserve, Granite Schoolhouse Lane is going to be the key in connecting the Union Army to two critical roads in its rear, the Tawny Town Road and the Baltimore Pike. Because of this connection, because of this area here, uh, this is going to become a perfect place to establish a hospital. When the Union Army 2nd Corps arrives to the battlefield at Gettysburg, several medical officers and personnel that Chris and I have talked about, Justin Dwinell uh, in particular, uh, Alexander Doherty, another one, 
These men are going to begin to look for locations to place their division and core level hospital. And as they are beginning on Cemetery Ridge and moving eastward, they are finding a problem. All the prime spots have been taken. The third core hospitals have been set up. The 12th core hospitals have been set up. And they continue to move eastward. And as they do, come down Granite School House Lane, they get to this little clearing and see this schoolhouse in the vicinity in which we now stand. A captain in the U.S. Medical Corps in 1916 who did a really detailed analysis of the Medical Corps, uh, the history of the United States Army's Medical Corps, wrote this. He said, the hospitals of the Second Corps were at first located in an opening of the woods along the crossroad from the Tawny Town Road to the Baltimore Pike with the headquarters at the Granite Schoolhouse. Another historian wrote that the division hospitals of the Second Corps were located July 2nd at the Granite Schoolhouse, but were soon moved to Rock Creek as Chris alluded to earlier, and how we tie into the cannonade of July 3rd. Surgeon Justin Dwinell, who we've heard about during our program tonight, noted that the 1st Division Hospital for the 2nd Corps was located near the Stone Schoolhouse. All three division-level hospitals of the 2nd Corps are placed in this area. All of them will have the, the hospital yellow flags, marking them as medical facilities, but the headquarters for all three divisions will be at Granite Schoolhouse. So by July 3rd, George Spangler's property is going to house a division-level hospital of the United States Army's 2nd Corps. The medical director of the 1st Division operating in this area, who had set up shop in the edge of the woods, uh, was Surgeon Robert C. Stiles. The surgeon in charge in this location was Dr. William uh, Potter of the 57th New York, who one historian noted was a highly opinionated surgeon who had grown up in a family of physicians in rural New York. A Dr. Charles Squire Wood, former New York City physician and now surgeon of the 66 New York Volunteers, would serve as the chief operator. And as combat began in Ernst on July 2nd, uh, at such places as Little Round Top, Devil's Den, the Wheat Field, the Peach Orchard, wounded of the 2nd Corps began to arrive. Surgeon Justin Dwinell recalled, about four o'clock, the wounded arrived in such large numbers that we soon had an accumulation of cases requiring amputation. The operators were kept at work until late in the evening and until they were compelled to desist from their labors from exhaustion. The other surgeons of the division who had been detailed to the hospital were busily engaged during the day performing various duties which had been assigned to them. One of the wounded men on July 2nd making his way to this location, to this hospital, was a lieutenant by the name of Charles Fuller. One of our rangers on staff a number of years ago edited Fuller's uh, diaries and accounts of the war, and it's from his work that we are able to share this personal story with you this evening. Just 22 years of age, wounded on the southern end of the battlefield, in an area known as the Wheat Field, Fuller recorded his experience. After being wounded and placed on an ambulance, he said when the ambulance started, it went anywhere but a good road. And as it bumped over logs and, it, uh, and boulders, my broken leg would thresh about like the mauler of a flail. I found it necessary to keep it in place by putting the other one over it. At last, we stopped and were unloaded. The young lieutenant was pulled out, uh, stretcher and all, and he was laid among the growing number of wounded around the 1st Division Hospital in the edge of the woods near this schoolhouse. Once again, however, Fuller would be forced to wait, this time to have his wounds examined. The New Yorker, which probably saved his life, decided to check his tourniquet. But it was growing dark, as it is this evening. Groping in the dark, he found his tourniquet. He tightened it as possibly, uh, as tight as he could, uh, and literally survived the pain of that and laid back to rest, waiting the surgeons to look at his wound. Fuller's leg would eventually be amputated at the Granite Schoolhouse Hospital. By midnight of July 2nd and into July 3rd, Justin Duenell said, I think at midnight there were none who had not been provided with good nourishing food. We were successful in finding sufficient hay for bedding for all of them. Where were they getting the bedding? from George Spangler's farm. 
Even as the new day was breaking on July 3rd, the hospitals were already running at full bore, struggling to treat the casualties of yesterday's clash. But a caveat is thrown into the story. Because as Chris mentioned, by July 2nd, these hospitals are too close to the main line of fighting. And it's decided on the late evening of July 2nd that these hospitals will be moved further to the east and to the south. But the order hadn't been acted upon. July 2nd passes. Dawn of July 3rd passes. And still they have not begun to evacuate the wounded. Surgeon Justin Dwinell recalled July 3rd. He said, during the morning of the 3rd, we succeeded in getting a sufficient supply of coffee, sugar, crackers, salt, and salt pork from several regimental commissaries. From early in the morning until noon, the operating surgeons were at work constantly at four different tables. The slighter wounds were dressed as fast as possible by the surgical staff and other help who had been on hand in expectation of an attack on our immediate front to take place in the latter part of the day. At 1 p.m. on July 3rd, the Confederate Army unleashes a two-hour bombardment <coughs> with 137 pieces of artillery, two and three shells being fired from each cannon every moment. As Chris alluded to, and as many of you know, many of those shells did not hit their mark on Cemetery Ridge. Many continued to travel into the rear and began to strike aid stations, such as the, the, the Frey Farm and the Patterson Farm, and division hospitals of the 2nd Corps, in the 11th Corps Hospital directly behind you. Surgeon Daniel Britton of the 11th Corps Hospital operating around the Spangler's Barn, where we're heading to next, recalled this. He said, on the afternoon of the 3rd, we were exposed to a sharp fire of shells. Several horses and one man were killed close to the hospital. Shells fell within 20 feet of the room in which we were, and we were much in fear that the barn would blaze, which would have been an unspeakfully frightful casualty. Fortunately, we did not have this to record. As Chris talked about earlier, eventually the evacuation of the division hospitals of the 2nd Corps would take place. Men would be loaded up in ambulances and taken further rear to the 2nd Corps hospital that had been established two miles from here. But not everyone at this location was accounted for. Not everyone at this location could be transferred further to the rear. Their wounds simply would not dictate it. One of those soldiers that was left behind was Hiram D. Clark of the 125th New York Infantry. He was lying unconscious, he was under anesthesia, and he was on the operating table of the 2nd Corps when the bombardment had begun. They finished the leg amputation, the division hospital packed up, and with the rest of the 2nd Corps moved off southward. Clark was unable to be moved. Still under anesthesia, the wound, the amputation fresh, they left him at the site. Surgeons would leave from the new hospital two miles from here and continued to come back and check on these wounded when they had a chance. As shells were crashing wildly in this direction and all around that, uh, all around Hiram Clark and the other men that were unable to be wounded, one recalled seeing Clark at this hospital. He noticed that he was coming to from, quote, the effects of chloroform. And with a smile on his lips, he remained uncomplainingly there through that terrible afternoon. But I want you to imagine, if you were wounded in 1861, 1862, just getting to a hospital was a challenge enough, let alone if it had been moved. But thankfully, because of the Letterman system, these men that were already at this hospital were being moved if they could, <clears throat> and those being removed from Cemetery Ridge to the rear by a professional corps of stretchermen and ambulance men knew where to go and would take them to those new locations. One more note about what's going on in this area. Not only do we have the 1st Division of the 2nd Corps Hospital here, we have the 11th Corps Field Hospital behind you. The Union Army's Artillery Reserve and Artillery Reserve Ammunition Train is also parked in the field directly behind you on the other side of the road. They too will have their own hospital, something they didn't have in 1861 and 1862. Again, artillery batteries were not given those uh, staff. So at this point in the story, George Spangler, who was asked to give right away for a school and a road, now has two very large hospitals on his property. 
with Confederate artillery fire falling fast around them. But who were some of the men that were here? Some of the men that we've been following in their footsteps today. Chris is going to pick up with the story of some Union officers, Hancock, Gibbon, and Woodruff. This spot 151 years ago would have been a scene of absolute confusion, of absolute chaos. The road behind you would have been choked with men trying to get to the rear, trying to get to the hospital, trying to get somewhere out of the way, trying to get someone to help them survive. And a lot of them went right past the Granite Schoolhouse. Uh, John Gibbon was one of them. John Gibbon wounded in the shoulder, remember, with a shattered collarbone. He gets all the way back to the Second Corps Field Hospital, the new one, which is going to be established along Rock Creek. Winfield Scott Hancock passes this too on his way to that same hospital. James Crocker, the Confederate, 9th Virginia, he goes past this place heading towards the Bushman Farm, 12th Corps Hospital. And I think it's uh, an interesting thing what happens once the battle's over. Your uh, level of care and the amount of attention provided to you doesn't necessarily depend on whether or not you're a Union or a Confederate soldier. Once you're wounded, you essentially become a non combatant. And James Crocker, Confederate, he's going to be treated at the 12th Corps Hospital. There are going to be surgeons there that put him through the same system that a, a wounded Union soldier is going to go through. What truly affects your care, your quality of care, is not whether you're a Union soldier or you're a Confederate soldier. It's whether you're a private or whether you're a major general or whether you're a brigadier general. This is what happens to John Gibbon. He's taken back to the 2nd Corps Hospital. His wound is dressed. A few, uh, a few minutes later, actually a few hours later, uh, his uh, lieutenant, Frank Haskell, arrives. They're reunited. Haskell fills him in on what happened on the battlefield, and then Gibbon is put on a wagon. And that wagon goes to Westminster. And the next day, he gets on a train. And that train takes him to Baltimore. And in a period of about 24 hours, he's in a bed with clean sheets. He's got attendants looking over him. He's getting good food. He's got everything he needs. That's what happens to a brigadier general. What happens to a major general? What happens to Winfield Scott Hancock? Well, after he passes Granite Schoolhouse, he goes to the 2nd Corps Hospital. He's got Alexander Doherty, the chief medical officer of the entire 2nd Army Corps with him. And that night, he rides to Westminster, Maryland. It was a painful ride for Hancock. It was a bumpy ride. But the next day, the 4th of July, he gets on a train. And that train goes to Baltimore. And then that train goes to Philadelphia. And he ends up in the La Pierre Hotel. Before he left Gettysburg, he sent a telegraph, a telegram to his wife, who's in St. Louis, for her to stop what he's, uh, she's doing and head to Philadelphia. How many mothers who have sons in Afghanistan today would like to get that kind of notification that quickly as Winfield Scott Hancock does on this battlefield on July 3rd, 1863? It's remarkable. At the LaPierre Hotel, clean clothes, good food, attendants looking over him, family members arrive, and when it's determined that, well, maybe the LaPierre Hotel is not the best place for him, maybe he should go to Norristown where his father lives, an entire company of volunteer firefighters escort him from the LaPierre Hotel to the train station. And at the train station, there's a detachment from the Invalid Corps that escorts him even further. That's the treatment a, a major general gets. Now, most everybody else, they're going to be treated at Granite Schoolhouse, or they're going to end up at the uh, Spangler Farm. But not everybody makes it that far. We're going to go further down the road. Not everybody did on July 3rd, 1863. One of the men whose journey ended and ended here was that young lieutenant we started talking about, George Woodruff, the man commanding that battery in Ziegler's Grove, the man shot in the abdomen and the intestines by a Confederate mini ball. He never makes it further than this spot, this spot in the woods that hundreds, if not thousands, of visitors drive down every single weekend. He's out there. He's behind the granite schoolhouse. And this is what Tully McRae, his friend, says. Woodruff had been wounded and disabled, and the men had placed him behind a tree to protect him from being further wounded. It was a sad sight for us to see his life coming to this untimely end. And for we knew it was the end from the nature of the wound. We removed him to the little schoolhouse, the little stone schoolhouse, in rear of the line of battle, where he remained until he died the next day. Everything that was, everything that was done that could be done with our limited means to make him as comfortable as possible was done. He died on July 4th, was buried behind the schoolhouse, and his grave so marked that it could be identified. 
When Tully McRae was burying George Woodruff, he found that unopened letter in Woodruff's pocket from his father telling young Woodruff that his mother had died only a few weeks before. Woodruff never made it that far. Hancock made it all the way to Philadelphia. Gibbon made it all the way to Baltimore. If you couldn't make it to Baltimore, if you couldn't make it to Philadelphia, but you could get past the Granite Schoolhouse, chances are you might end up at the 2nd Corps Hospital or you might end up at the 11th Corps Hospital, which is going to be our next stop. Well, I want to welcome you here now to the home of George and Elizabeth Spangler and their four children. Uh, that they had purchased this property in 1848, and little could they have imagined, like the other sites that we visited this evening, what would be in store for their property in 1863. Um, as we've already talked a little bit of the storyline as what has been taking place, um, George Spangler's uh, livelihood, his landscape would forever be altered on July 1st. As battle is, is waging six, seven miles north and west of town, this property is going to be um, uh, taken over, if you will, by the 11th Army Corps' medical staff and personnel. Uh, it is an ideal location. There's plenty of wide open ground. Uh, remember, all the supplies for the field hospitals are down the road in Westminster, so they don't have field hospital tents, they don't have cots, they don't have fresh clothes, they don't have the food, the supplies, they need some sort of shelter for the wounded. Spangler's farm can definitely fulfill that need. His massive Pennsylvania bank barn in front of you, some of his outbuildings, his summer kitchen to your left, several other outbuildings that stood at the time of the battle um, that are no longer standing, and of course, his farmhouse as well. He has two wells on the property. Several fingers of Rock Creek extend onto his property. He has wooded areas for shade and wood. He has miles of fencing uh, that can help not only uh, uh, light fires and, and supply fires, but can be used in a whole other manner uh, of things necessary to a hospital. Acres of standing wheat and straws um, that can be used for hospital bedding and bed ticking. He has uh, bushels and bushels and bushels of food. Uh, the Spangler family grew in 1860 600 bushels of ears of corn. So there's a lot of food on the property here as well. So this is an ideal location surrounded by those main roads, the Baltimore Pike behind you, the Tawny Town Road in front of you, and connected by the Granite Schoolhouse Lane. So this is an ideal location for the 11th Army Corps Hospital. It's also an ideal location for the Union Army's Artillery Reserve, which begins to arrive on the late evening of July 1st and into July 2nd. In the fields to your right, the fields that we just walked through, 114 cannon, 1,400 officers and men, 3,000 horses will be parked in those fields during the battle. This landscape has absolutely and utterly changed. At any one point during the battle, Spangler's property will be consumed not only by the Union Army's artillery reserve and its ammunition, but the 11th Corps Field Hospital around these buildings, the 1st Division of the 2nd Corps Field Hospital at Granite Schoolhouse, and the artillery reserves hospital as well. They are supporting literally thousands of wounded soldiers in and around this area for the days and weeks to come. As we've made our way to this location tonight, we have been following in the footsteps of several of those wounded men. Uh, Chris gave you the ultimate uh, conclusion to Lieutenant Woodruff and Hancock and Gibbon. But what about some of those other men that we heard of at the beginning of the program? Alikium Sherrill, who had been under arrest on July 2nd. Frederick Stowe, one of the sons of the famous Harriet Beecher Stowe and Brigadier General Lewis Armistead. It's puzzling that unlike Hancock, a major general, John Gibbon, another general, struggling to find a stretcher, let alone an ambulance to get them to a hospital, Brigadier General Lewis Armistead, a Confederate Brigadier General, was not only able to have Union soldiers, New Yorkers, find him a stretcher to get him off the field, but an ambulance as well. And they are taking the very same route as close as possible to the same route that we took tonight, 151 years later. One of the soldiers attending to Armistead, getting him off of Cemetery Ridge and heading eastward, was a New Yorker by the name of John Irvin. He wrote this. 
He said, General Armistead was brought to the hospital. Ed Edson Ames and me carried him to George Spangler's and laid him on a bed. He had two wounds in the body and one in the thigh. I gave him some liquor. Dr. Henry Van Arnhem, we heard about his qualifications two stops ago. Recall this. He said, I had the dressing and care of the rebel general Armistead and came into Spangler's House Hospital at dusk of evening. He was wild, nervous, flighty, said war must cease. Men of the same blood said he could not live. I had him stripped and found no fatal wounds. And I told him he would not die. Unfortunately, he would die. At about midnight, he grew irrational, wild. He was fine looking. He had a watch, $1.62 of change of federal money, and lots of Confederate money, rings, and etc. Armistead would die from his wounds here at the 11th Corps Field Hospital. When we were talking about rank and privilege, if you were a private that arrived here at this hospital, your surgeon, your doctor may be attending to 70, 100 other patients. If you are an officer such as Armistead, you're going to be attended to by a personal physician. Dr. Henry Van Arnhem, in addition to his duties, taking care of those 70, 100 privates, he is going to personally attend to Armistead. Dr. Daniel Britton, who we heard about as well, in charge of this hospital here at the 11th Corps Field Hospital, will also personally attend to Armistead. Unfortunately, he would not be able to overcome those wounds. And at 9 o'clock on the morning of July 5th, he would pass away here at the 11th Corps Field Hospital. The historical record is unclear as to where exactly he died. Many historians will place him in the Spangler Summer Kitchen. But there's also some evidence that may take him and place him inside the Spangler's home in one of their six rooms. The other five rooms in the house would be occupied, four of them would be occupied by wounded soldiers and medical personnel, one of them, the six-member family of the Spanglers. They chose to stay here on their property, and for five weeks they would live in one of those rooms, 10 by 13, day in and day out. Armistead would initially be buried on the farm. Uh, those that assisted in that said he was wrapped in a blanket and buried just back of the barn that was filled with wounded men. Several weeks later, uh, his body would be disinterred. And a native of Stark County, Ohio, a man by the name of Aldred Ryder, uh, wrote years after the war to uh, John Batchelor, one of the early historians of Gettysburg, about what happened to Armistead's body next. Uh, he said, I was detailed by Dr. James Armstrong of Philadelphia, surgeon at the 11th Corps Hospital on the George Spangler Farm near the Tawny Town Road to bury the dead and take their effects to turn the same over to him and record their names in the book. I buried General Armistead, and his body was afterward disinterred and embalmed by Dr. Chamberlain of Philadelphia. Dr. Chamberlain told me that he thought Armistead's friends would pay a good price for his body. Hence, after it had lain in a rough box buried in the Confederate Party 11th Corps Cemetery on the Spangler Farm, four weeks later he embalmed it. I always thought that his friends had gotten it or that Mrs. Robert E. Lee had taken it with the rest of the Confederates to Richmond. If Armistead was in one of the rooms of the Spangler House, he had good company because another room would be occupied by Elikium Sherrill. The man who was placed under arrest on July 2nd had been on his horse on Cemetery Ridge on July 3rd and the Confederate musket ball had pierced his bowels. Sherrill would struggle for nearly a day before he would succumb to those wounds. His second in command of his regiment, the 126th New York, Lieutenant James Bull, had the, not the pleasure, maybe pleasure to serve with Cheryl, but the honor to write home to Cheryl's wife and children what happened to him. He wrote this on July 10th. Madame, with extreme sorrow, I have to inform you that your husband fell mortally wounded here on the third instant at about 6 p.m., in the fearless and honorable discharge of his duty. He fell in a part of the field away from that in which I was engaged. He being near the 39th New York while I was in command of our regiment. 
He was removed without my knowledge to the 11th Corps Hospital, and I could not, though I made unusual efforts to learn his whereabouts until last evening. Despite soldiers attending to Hancock of his command, despite soldiers and staff officers attending to Gibbon under his command, Alekium Sherrill would be removed to this hospital without the knowledge of his men. And although others wounded would be placed in the house with him, he would die alone, surrounded by unfamiliar faces. And another room in the Spangler's house would be that of Frederick Stowe, that Confederate artillery fragment that tore away part of his right ear, his jaw, some teeth, and part of his mouth, or his tongue. Stowe would also be attended to by Henry Van Arnhem of New York. When he arrived, uh, Dr. Hovey, another surgeon on the site, said this, uh, Frederick Stowe of General Adolf von Steinweir's staff was in one corner of one of the little bedrooms of the Spangler's home. Dr. Daniel Britton, the surgeon in charge here at the 11th Corps Hospital, said no one on the staff had been killed and the only wounded was Captain Frederick Stowe. In the peristoid process of the temporal bone by a fragment of shell which I extracted on July 3rd. Stowe, unlike the other officers that would be brought here and lose that battle, for their life would survive. He would make a recovery here at the hospital and go on to serve for the rest of the American Civil War. But you may recall since the age of 16 Stowe was fighting another battle, one of alcoholism. He had been successful in 1861 and 1862 and 1863 of not only escaping a wound but escaping that fight. When he arrived here at the hospital the first thing administered to him was none other and alcohol. When the war was over, Stowe's battle with alcoholism would pick back up. And by 1870, he decided he needed a fresh start, would head out west, eventually making his way to California. He was there only a year when he disappeared from history. We don't know what happened to Frederick Stowe, where he ultimately ended up, how he died, where he died, or where he is buried today. For the Spangler family, they would have a significant recovery as well, like Stowe and many of the other wounded that were brought here. But so would the Patterson family, whose property we visited this evening. Chris will tell you now about the Pattersons and their recovery effort as the men whose mangled bodies were brought there recovered as well. I won't belabor the point. Uh, belabor the point. Uh, William Patterson's family suffered enormous damage as a result of their property being a hospital during the Battle of Gettysburg. And I'm going to run down a tally here real quick. And every time I say something lost, I want you to think in your mind, how would Justin Dwinnell have used that piece of property? How would a doctor or a surgeon at that farm made use of that particular thing? This is from his 1868 application for damages, for compensation. Patterson family lost one carriage, one wagon bed, 600 shingles, one quilt, one blanket, two barrels of flour, four bread pans, two frying pans, one tub, one feather bed and pillow, 12 pounds of feathers, eight yards of ticking, five buckets, 12 tons of hay, 60 bushels of wheat, 4,500 rails, and on and on and on. And the Spangler family, they probably measured it in a very similar way. Once this was all over, everybody measured the cost of Gettysburg in their, own, in their own units. For the Pattersons, for the Spanglers, it was measured in rails and hay that was gone and fields that were destroyed. For Woodruff, for Armistead, for Cheryl, it's their lives, it cost them their lives. For Tully McRae, Woodruff's friend, it cost him his friend. Winfield Scott Hancock, John Gibbon, they would live, but they would carry the scars of Gettysburg with them for the rest of his, uh, their lives. They were alive, though. Um, we've been on this journey now, and we've, um, we've just gotten a little bit of a taste of how difficult it is to get from a place like Cemetery Ridge to the George Spangler Farm. All the stops you had to go through, the arduous task of getting an ambulance, the horrific scenes at the Granite Schoolhouse. And these scenes were horrific, but imagine how bad they would have been if this system wasn't in place to deal with the wounded. Imagine how many more men would count the cost of Gettysburg as being their lives or the lives of their friends. Uh, Justin Dwinnell, 
in his, uh, his report on his part of the battle, I think he summed it up best. He said this, In a great hospital, as this has been in spite of every precaution that can be devised by man, and all that can be done to relieve distress of body and mind, there must always be a vast amount of suffering which God alone can relieve. This is one of the conditions of war. It is the price of liberty. We uh, benefit from that price of liberty 151 years later. What is the monument to Justin Dwinnell? What is the monument to Jonathan Letterman? Where's the monument to, to the doctors, the surgeons, the, the ambulance drivers that saved these men's lives or that tried to? Jonathan Letterman doesn't have an equestrian statue on the battlefield. Jonathan Letterman, his name is mentioned on a little plaque down by, by the uh, Route 30, by the Walmart. That's all he's got. What is his monument? What is the monument to the ambulance drivers, to the men that worked in that farmhouse, in this barn? I would say it's two things. It's the medics in Iraq and Afghanistan who do essentially the same exact thing today based off of this system, and it works because it had to go through the crucible that was the Battle of Gettysburg and the American Civil War. Every wounded vet who's hanging out with their family tonight, that's their monument. Every wounded Iraq vet who gets to go and walk their dog at the end of the day, this is their monument. And um, this battlefield is their monument too. We started on Cemetery Ridge a mile and a half that way, and now we're at this hospital, this farm. We haven't stepped on private land the entire time. Every inch of this ground is preserved and it's protected. That journey that we made, you can come back next year and do that. Hopefully, this land will always be here. And if it is, we can always tell that story. That is their monument. And if you ever have to ride in an ambulance, if you have to go to the emergency room, you'll be seeing their monument real close. I think that is the legacy of what we've done today. That is the legacy of what happened on this battlefield 151 years ago in unassuming places like the George Spangler Farm, the Granite Schoolhouse, and the backyard of the William Patterson Farm. This program was truly a collaborative program. Dan works for the Gettysburg Foundation. I work for the National Park Service. The Gettysburg Foundation, they've preserved this farm. We'll always have it. The National Park Service has preserved that battlefield out there, and as long as we have that, we can always tell this story, and we can always stand in what I didn't think was going to be a beautiful sunset today <laughs> and talk about what happened here. On behalf of the National Park Service, on behalf of Dan and the Gettysburg Foundation, I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you.